Welcome back to Pace Immigration, paceimmigration.com, talking with immigration lawyer Michael O'Rourke. Michael, good to talk to you. Hi, Sean. How's it going? Going very well, thank you. We're talking about U.S. immigration, humanitarian parole in the U.S. Uh, usually we hear parole in, ter- in legal circles. It means someone getting out of jail. In this case, it actually means someone getting into the United States. I've got a slide up here if you're watching on the YouTube channel as opposed to listening on the podcast. Uh, there's a bunch of language on the screen here, but basically what it comes down to, if someone's not usually allowed into the United States, parole gives them the chance to enter, yes? Yes, exactly. Parole is a special permission to enter the U.S. uh, if you might otherwise be inadmissible. Say uh, you don't have a visa or you don't uh, have the normal entry permission into the United States, say if you have a criminal background. Uh, Parole is an option that sometimes can work. Okay, I've got it here again, like you were saying. Uh, It's a catch-all phrase, according to the U.S. government, uh, for them to parole people in. Uh, We'll carry on to our next slide. Reasons for parole. There's several several on the screen here. We've got uh, you need medical treatment in the United States. You have to visit a sick relative. Go into some of these for us. Sure. So these are usually in the humanitarian parole, at least uh, for the first few points on our slide. Um, If, for instance, you need urgent medical treatment or a relative is sick and dying in the hospital or there is a funeral and you don't have the the proper visa to come into the United States uh, and you require a visa to come into the United States or a waiver to come into the United States if you're visa free, a parole can uh, sometimes be applied for to overcome this entry barrier. There's some interesting ones here. Let's go through a couple. So obtain medical treatment. Uh, like, what are we talking about? So there could be, look, there's got to be millions of people that aren't, uh, that are inadmissible to, to the United States for various reasons. What constitutes a medical treatment? Are we talking about something? So I'm assuming this is life-saving stuff. Yeah, generally it's life-saving stuff, stuff that's not available where you're at. Um, for one reason or another, maybe the expert who does uh, a specific procedure or is the expert in a, a orphan disease or something on that order is in the United States, it is almost always based on something that is urgent or an emergent condition. It's not well, I need to go see my family doctor who lives over in Buffalo and I'm in St. Catharines, for instance, uh, using a a super local example for Ontario and New York. Um, It's more for this is absolutely necessary. I don't have time to get a visa and uh, I will really suffer harm if I'm not allowed into the United States for this limited purpose. Okay, let's look at a couple of other ones that are kind of interesting to me anyway. So appear, appear for and participate in civil litigation or criminal prosecution. This kind of reminds me of that scene in The Godfather where uh, the family member was sitting there in Congress. And I'm like, well, how did he get into the United States anyway? Would, would that be something like this, like you need to bring in a key witness for something? Yeah, that could be uh, the case. For instance, if uh, you are required to uh, either give testimony or uh, if you're required to, say, give a deposition in a trial and you don't have the proper visa, uh, as long as you can prove the urgency and the the very specific need for being allowed into the United States, it's worth making the application. Uh, Usually, these applications will fail if the person would otherwise have time to get a visa, if it weren't very urgent. Yeah, let's look at the inhumane separation of families then, because I have a feeling people watching this video might think, aha, that's uh, maybe an avenue for me to get into the United States. This doesn't, I mean, this is a family member of um, refugee law in a sense, but this doesn't replace it, does it? No, it doesn't. And uh, a parole is not an admission in terms of typical immigration speak. It's, it is usually allowed for a discrete period of time for a specific purpose. Um, but uh, it is 
used in um, cases where, say, part of the family is in the United States and have been resettled as refugees and other parts of the family, say a, a, a child uh, or an elderly relative, are still in the home country and facing potential prosecution or persecution, excuse me. Right. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to the process itself. There's you mentioned in an email to me. There's there's two main ones. Let's go into option number one. With and this is when when we finally get back into our you know alpha alphabet soup as we like to call it with the immigration law. I one three one application. Go into this a bit. Yeah, so because I'm a U.S. immigration lawyer, I can only really speak in forms and numbers. Uh, but uh, the I-131 application is your general request for travel document, but it is also the form that's used to request humanita humanitarian parole from USCIS. Uh, this is really the route to use if you are not already in a contiguous country to the U.S. and can present yourself at a land border. Um, so uh, this application is filled with the, uh, or filed with USCIS. You have to really succinctly state why you need to come to the United States, why there is this humanitarian issue. And you have to have an affidavit of support from a sponsor in the United States showing that they can support you when you are coming. Um, right now, uh, when we're shooting this video, there is a massive backlog of humanitarian parole applications from people in Syria and people in Afghanistan due to recent conflicts there. So um, it, processing times, the 60 to 120 day processing time is, I think, a stretch at this point, I think you're seeing a, a, a much larger processing time. Yeah, but you, I'm sorry, Michael. I oh, just, sorry. So, yeah, but yeah. there is a way to expedite it. Right. Um, it it's in the uh, instructions to the Form 131. But in general, you have to write expedite in large capital letters in black, not blue, not red, not anything else, but must be in black, and really succinctly state why this is an emergency, extremely urgent situation. And what types of severe financial loss or loss of life um, uh, you would face if you were not allowed to come into the United States. So when uh, we go back to our list of uh, reasons for this, that would be something like uh, the court case is next week and we need this witness to give evidence or the sick relative, it's terminal cancer and the doctor can provide a note maybe that um, it, you know the person could pass in the next few days, something like that? Yes, exactly. Uh, the last case that we did here at our office, uh, we had a gentleman who was in Canada and he was not vaccinated. And of course, right now, the policy for the US is uh, that you must have a full course of vaccinations to enter the country. He did not. Uh, he had a dying relative in the U.S. South, and uh, he had tried to make the application with the CBP, which is our second step uh, or second route, which I'll explain next. But uh, they felt that it wasn't well documented enough to allow him to come into the country. So um, after we advised him, uh, he was able to overcome their concerns and was allowed to travel to see his relative before they passed. Excellent work. Uh, the last note here, if approved, you must give biometrics and apply for boarding foil at consulate abroad. What's all that about? So when you're outside of the US, you are either required to have a visa or be part of visa waiver program generally to come into the US. If you're asking for humanitarian parole, you probably need a visa. In order to do that, uh, a boarding foil is like a temporary visa, if you think about that. It's, it's something that's slapped into your passport at the consulate that shows that you are being paroled into the United States or at least granted parole for CBP to consider when you're coming in. And um, it, generally when it comes to that, they also collect biometrics to make sure that you are who you say you are. Okay, let's move on to option two. This one is slightly different because it's more, is this more in person? Because I see here we've got port of entry. Yes, exactly. So this is what uh, somebody would do if they're coming 
from either Canada or Mexico to a U.S. border post. Uh, it is an in-person application that is considered by the uh, port director or the port director's designee at a CBP port of entry. Okay, and we have a uh, Buffalo. Well, we're we're in Ontario, so we we know a lot about getting over there with the Buffalo Peace. <laughs> yeah, break. exactly. And you've got some uh, contact details here as well. What what's your uh, experience been with phoning that number or sending that email? Do you get a response relatively quickly? Yes. Oh, yes. That's excellent. They they do take it very seriously, and uh, we found that our colleagues at CBP in Buffalo are very sensitive to their duties in carrying out humanitarian parole. So uh, it's not something that you just call up the person and say, hey, I want to come into the United States. You have to have a very well-documented case. And um, uh, I always suggest if you're going to do this on your own, to email them first, have a very good explanation as to why it's urgent and why you need to come over. Is there anything that you're saying w would have you say, like, forget about it, like a serious criminality or something in someone's past or or is parole kind of a, hey, try it anyway? Parole is a case by case uh, assessment of how urgent is it? What is the significant benefit to the United States or the uh, humanitarian crisis that somebody is facing? and whether that person they think will leave after the grant of parole and whether they feel that they are being honest with their need and whether that need is documented. So I don't think there are many barriers to granting parole if you meet this very high evidentiary uh, showing that you need to have an actual humanitarian need to come in to the U.S. Right. So we've talked about specifics. We'll move on to parole based on nationality. This one seems more like a blanket um, where it's offered to people um, at large, as it were, depending on where they're from. Go into this a little bit. Sure. So these parole programs, they're not necessarily the urgent need that humanitarian parole is, but they fall under the blanket of uh, parole because they are, again, an ass assessment of case-by-case -case basis, but for certain groups of people. So there's uh, currently like the Haitian Family Re Reunification Parole Program. There's one for Cubans. Uh, there are a few out there that are based on the idea of reuniting families and helping people to escape very dire conditions. So um, a, a, these all require applications to USCIS and uh, they are um, uh, they are strong programs that uh, the U.S. has kept open for many years. Yeah, I mean, right now, of course, when we're recording this program, uh, there's the Ukraine conflict. We've already done a video on temporary protected status. This sounds like a cousin of temporary protected status. What's the difference? So the difference really is that with temporary protected status, at the time the protection is announced, you have to have already been in the United States. Right. So you could request humanitarian parole based on your circumstances. Say you're coming uh, under fire, your, your town is being besieged in Ukraine. You could file an application with USCIS or a relative could for humanitarian parole. And if it's granted, then you're allowed to come to the United States but you do not qualify for TPS because that has already been announced. If Take, TP, oh, sorry. Uh, let yeah. me just uh, add this because I think it's important. Sure. Temporary protected status is renewed from time to time. So that date on which you have to have been in the United States in order to take advantage of it can shift. So it's not always going to be March 1st, 2022, which is the current date for Ukrainian temporary protected status. It, the next iteration of it might say any Ukrainian national who is in the United States as of December 1st might be then be granted temporary protected status. So if you're already in the United States on humanitarian parole, 
and the TPS program catches up, it could conceivably catch you and give you status that way. Do you anticipate a program being announced uh, like the Haitian Family Reunification Parole Program, something like that for Ukrainians? I could see it happening. I haven't heard any rumors of it yet, but uh, I know the Biden administration is working on different routes to help Ukrainians come to the United States. So I don't know if there is an idea yet for a parole program, but it is possible. Last question on this point. If it is a parole program, then should you be emailing as an individual or should you be contacting a lawyer such as yourself and saying, hey, I want to get in on this program? You know, once a parole program is announced, I think because it is usually involving a lot of paperwork and proof, I, I always think it's better in situations like this to contact a lawyer. Uh, of course, anybody can try anything on their own, but when you have a complex program that you're interacting with and documentary requirements, I think then it's always better to have a lawyer on your side. Right. And uh, you are the lawyer to do that. That's Michael O'Rourke, M. O'Rourke at PaceLawFirm.com. Uh, Michael, thanks for talking to us, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Sean. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.